that's a new thing. I've never heard it say that before. I've never seen that either. <laughs> okay, here comes Drew. So anyway, as I was saying, thank you guys for being flexible and for um, joining us on an off day. But we just felt like with the changes and the updates and the way that COVID has impacted ETB benefits, that it was really important for you guys to hear from Brandy and Drew today, as opposed to waiting a little bit later. So thank you guys for your flexibility. Um, most of you or some of you have probably, oh, that's great, Brandy. She said that she can email it to us, the power, the presentation, but she put it in the chat box. So as always, feel free to use that chat box to ask your questions if you don't want to forget, and then they'll have time to answer your questions um, towards the end here. But I wanted to, for those of you that did have not done this presentation with us before, I wanted to introduce you to Brandy and to Drew. Um, Brandy, y'all saw this in the bio that I emailed out to you, but she um, has a, an extensive history with children in foster care. She's worked with the youth for the last 15 years, and she has specialized in working with children or youth that are aging out of care. And now she's the ETB specialist with BCFS. And so we're really excited to have her joining us. Drew also has a lot of experience. He worked in the education field. He was a paraprofessional, a teacher, an instructor for over 15, 16 years. So he has a, wa a very de deep wealth of experience. Sorry, I got tongue twisted on that. And then he's been with BCFS, I believe, for three years. Oh, I've got someone else to admit there. And so they, have, they come to us with just a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge about what our youth are facing and how we can help them navigate this confusing or can be a little bit confusing ground of getting into college and the benefits that are available to them. So um, Brandy and Drew, welcome. Thank you for coming and speaking to our group today. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, as she said, I'm Brandy Perswell with BCFS Health and Human Services um, here out of San Antonio, Texas. Um, we are actually still working from home right now, but normally I, uh, Drew and I would be based out of the Transition Center um, here. Um, I have been a CPS caseworker for about seven years here in San Antonio, so I'm very familiar with what you guys do. Um, and then um, I've been in this position for the last four years. And normally Drew and I travel all over the state of Texas talking to you guys and to youth, anyone and everyone who touches foster care um, about um, the education and training voucher and how to help your students apply. Um, we've just seen um, lots of holes over the years where, um, for instance, um, when we went to El Paso, and we were actually doing a training for the CASA in El Paso. They had never heard of the Transition Center and didn't know where it was. And the Transition Center had no idea who CASA was and what they did. So we had the CASA training at the Transition Center in El Paso so that they could, in, they could meet each other and introduce what they do so they could work more closely together. And so this has kind of become a presentation about college resources um, for youth in foster care. And I will warn you, it's gonna be a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, but again, you guys are welcome to the PowerPoint and all the information. And if you guys ever have any questions, you can reach out to Drew and I, if we don't know the answer, we can let you know who does. Um, Drew, would you? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Drew Melton, and I am an ETV specialist with BCFS Health and Human Services. Um, and as was mentioned before, I was in the education field for about 15 years, and I was also a case manager for about three years here in San Antonio. So I, I kind of got to see um, a lot of the obstacles that our students and our youth are facing that are that they are facing as they are aging out of care. Um, just as Brandy mentioned, <clears throat> we definitely wanna get this word out to our, our youth as, soon, as early and as often as possible. So if you have any connections to your local ISDs, we would definitely be willing to do, uh, to do a presentation to let them know about all these post-secondary benefits. 
So the first thing we want to mention to you guys is House Bill 2537. Um, this actually went into effect back in 2017, and it requires that all high school counselors talk to their students in foster care every school year about their post-secondary school benefits. But what we have found is that the school districts are not aware of this, that hasn't trickled down, and then the school counselors are not familiar with all of these benefits. So um, if you have any connection to your school district, education service center, maybe you're even a high school counselor yourself, please let them know this is a free service. Pass along mine and Drew's information and we will be more than happy whether virtually or once we start traveling again. So if it's something maybe like in August, um, we would love to come out and uh, train their high school counselors and foster care liaisons on um, this information. So the first post-secondary benefit we're gonna go into is the Texas tuition and fee waiver. And this is basically a state law that waives tuition and fees for youth that are aging out of foster care. Um, in order to access the tuition and fee waiver, students do need to access it before they turn 25 years old. If they do access it before they turn 25 years old, they get it for the rest of their life. So they can go get as many degrees as they would like. Um, they can go to school until they're 99 years old if that's what they, if that's what they wanna do. <clears throat> If they do not access it, and by access, I mean they need to take that one college course at a state supported school before they turn 25, they lose this benefit. There's no age limit to enroll. So if you have any early graduators, they would also be eligible, as well as no limit on credit hours. They only need to take that one college course and they lock it in for the rest of their life. Also, it doesn't depend on their GPA. Students can actually fail every class that they ever take and they'll still be eligible for this tuition and fee waiver. And then for those students that might be thinking of leaving the state of Texas, but maybe taking online classes at a public school in Texas, they would be eligible for the tuition waiver as well. So this is from the Department of Family and Protective Services website. Um, we don't wanna read all of these off to you, but basically if a student hits any one of these bullet points, they should qualify for the tuition and fee waiver. This is very broad, lots of students who have ever been in foster care. Um, a lot of them qualify, not all, but some of, uh, most of them qualify, unlike the Texas Education and Training voucher that Drew and I work with. The next post-secondary benefit we're gonna talk about is the Education and Training voucher. And this is the program that Brandy and myself work for. Um, <clears throat> It is often confused, uh, gets confused with the tuition and fee waiver, but they are two separate benefits and they can be used simultaneously. So the education and training voucher or ETV can be used, um, is actually a federal need-based fund. So students do need to exhibit a need. Um, it's, it basically provides up to $12,000 per school year for students that are attending uh, post-secondary school. And that $12,000 is first allocated towards any housing or utilities um, that the student needs to pay throughout the school year. And then any tuition and fees, if, if a student is going to a technical vocational school or a private school and they're not able to uh, use that tuition waiver, they can uh, use these funds for that as well. Uh, once those entities have been accounted for, the rest of the funding goes directly to the student and they can use it for personal living expenses, for childcare, books and school supplies. Most students will buy a laptop or a computer at one point in their ETV funding. They can also use the ETV funds for transportation, uh, meaning they can buy a bus pass, they can buy a bicycle. If a student already has a car, they can use it for car maintenance, car registration, insurance, things like that. However, the federal government does not actually allow them to purchase a vehicle with the ETV funding. And I do just want to add that 12,000 is just for this current school year and for the next, for the 21-22 school year due to COVID. It normally is 5,000 and we do anticipate at some point it is going to go back down, but that's all the guidance we have right now from state office is for this school year and next school year. So in order for the 21-22 school year, that application is out right now and students should be applying as soon as possible. 
So in order to be eligible, they have to be 16 to 24 years old. Normally it ends the month of their 23rd birthday, but because of COVID, um, it, is, it has been extended to the month of their 25th birthday for next school year. There are only three scenarios where a student qualifies for ETV, unlike that tuition and fee waiver where most of them do. In order to qualify for ETV, they have to currently be in foster care, have aged out of foster care, meaning they were in foster care on their 18th birthday or when they emancipated out, um, or they were adopted or entered a PCA program after their 16th birthday. Any other scenario and they do not qualify. So if they are reunified with their parents, they no longer qualify for ETV. If the judge transfers PMC or permanent managing conservatorship to a friend or a relative without there being a PCA agreement after their 16th birthday, they no longer qualify for ETV. So again, it's they're in care, they aged out, or they were adopted or entered a PCA agreement after their 16th birthday. Um, it can only be used for 15 semesters total, and it will end the month of their 25th birthday if they're going to be turning 25 um, next school year. So it'll be prorated to that month. If your student, um, there are two documents that your students are going to need to get in order to apply to ETV. One, of course, is a copy of that tuition and fee waiver. Um, and the other is called a verification of eligibility. I'll be honest with you, that name is not even important. The student or even you can help them. You can contact their PAL worker directly and just tell them they need the two documents for ETV. The coordinator will know exactly what they need. If you don't know who their PAL worker is, you can contact Kimberly Brucewitz and um, with To Engage and she can assist in um, who that um, student's uh, PAL worker is. If the student has been adopted after their 16th birthday, we will actually have to get that, that verification of eligibility from state office. So when they apply, they just need to make sure that they mark that they're adopted. A lot of our adopted students, for some reason, still pick foster care, even though there's an option for adoption. Uh, we, if they do mark that, we will get that for them. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times when they put that they're in foster care, we then don't know that they were adopted. And so we have to keep asking them for that document. And a lot of times they don't know what it is or how to get it because they didn't have a power worker. So um, again, you, you guys can always contact Kimberly um, if you need help identifying a student's power worker. And then we do have a question in the chat. Um, it's what if they were in foster care up until the age of 11 when they were adopted? And in that case, uh, that student will most likely be eligible for the tuition waiver. However, in order to be eligible for ETV, they would have to be adopted after they turn 16 years old. Hope that answers your question. Do we have any other questions? And you guys are actually welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question if you need to. You can put it in the chat or you can state it. I'll, I do have a question. I think what I get confused about, and I think that helped clarify with that question, there's a difference between the ETV funds and those being limited for 16 and older and the tuition waiver. I think, I think we get confused a lot within those two pieces. Is that right, Brandy? I'm sorry, was that for me? Yeah, yeah so... Um... Yeah, that's what, we see a lot. that's what we see a lot is that um, people do get those two confused. Um, and so that's why Drew and I just try to point out that that tuition and fee waiver, it's like best practice is really, um, you'll have to check with the um, student's caseworker or with the Department of Family and Protective Services because so many of them qualify for the tuition and fee waiver. Um, I mean, sometimes you can have certain students, they were in foster care one day and they qualify, but it's just if they hit any one of those bullet points that they have on the Department of Family and Protective Services website, whereas ETV is very limited. They have okay. to have like only been in, the, like it's only those three scenarios, any of those other ones, and they do lose that benefit. So 
That's why, like, if you have any 15 year olds waiting to be adopted, do not let them be adopted any before their 16th birthday. Tell them, no, you have to wait till your 16th birthday. <laughs> Don't let them do it. But all um, you said, if, if they get PCA benefits, though, you can negotiate that. Well, PCA also has to be after their 16th birthday or they no longer qualify. So PCA or adopted, don't let it happen while they're 15. Make them wait till their 16th birthday. They can do it on their 16th birthday, but if it is literally even a day before their 16th birthday, they no longer qualify. And that's a state of Texas rule. They are the ones who determine that eligibility. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, and, and we are gonna go through kind of a breakdown between the differences uh, of the tuition waiver and ETV here in a minute. Um, so ETV funds, if a student is eligible for ETV, they uh, can also access ETV if they're taking dual credits in high school. If a student is taking a dual credit course in high school, they only need to be taking that one course in order to be eligible for ETV. Once they graduate high school or they get that uh, GED, they will need to be taking at least six semester hours in order to qualify for ETV funding. And because uh, ETV is a federal fund, they can use it for associate's degree, their bachelor's degree, any graduate degree programs. And uh, most post-secondary schools around the nation, as long as those schools have been accredited and in business for at least two years. So again, just to kind of recap, you have the tuition and fee waiver, which is done by the state of Texas. It is only at Texas public schools. It doesn't physically give the student money. It just tells the school to waive their tuition and fees and not charge them for it. And that is tuition and fees associated with classes. It, it, optional fees and, and things are not covered by that. Like for instance, like a dorm room is not covered. It is a lifetime benefit though, as long as they lock it in prior to their 25th birthday by taking one college course, um, they can get as many degrees as they want. They can be taking classes when they're 100 and there's no grade requirements. They can fail every class they ever take. They will not lose this, like they'll lose their financial aid and such. ETV is federally funded, so they can take it out of the state of Texas and use it at private schools. And again, these can be used together it is need-based though. So when they fill out their financial aid form, it's gonna be based off of their financial aid need and the cost of attendance for their school. It's at any post-secondary educational institute in the nation, as long as it's been in business for two years and is accredited. Right now, it's temporarily going from 5,000 to 12,000 a school year, again, based on need. It's going to be from 16 to 24 years old for this upcoming school year. It's going to end the month of their 25th birthday. And they do have to make satisfactory academic progress by their eighth semester or they could lose ETV. Um, they can mess up all they want to until their eighth semester. And then they have to have their grades and their completion rate has to be satisfactory with the school. And every school has a different standard in order to keep ETV. Any questions on any of those? And just, I'd just like to mention an, an example uh, of, of a student that really takes advantage of using both of those benefits. Uh, we have a young lady attending a public school in Texas, so she's able to use her tuition and fee waiver. She's also uh, receiving that Pell Grant money. Um, she's working two jobs and she's going to school full time. So she's able to spend all of that ETV funding um, on what she needs for her school supplies and whatever she needs for school. And she's been able to save everything that she makes on her two jobs. As a sophomore, she's already saved over $20,000. And um, for if, if, you, if you know our students at all, you know that they're really going to need this when they graduate college. Um, she's, she's really going to have a great start. Um, she's not going to have parents to go back home to until she finds a job. You know, she's, she's out there in the workforce immediately after she graduates. So um, that's really an extreme example. Most of our students do use the ETV funding for rent, you know, just to, to help them keep a roof over their head throughout the semester. But um, it can really be a great benefit if, if students take advantage. 
So uh, in order to access ETV, students do need to apply for financial aid. Next year, this will be a requirement for all graduating seniors to fill out the FAFSA before graduating high school. We just wanna make sure that they're applying for uh, financial aid uh, as close to October 1st as possible. We wanna make sure that they make themselves eligible for all of those first come first serve grants and scholarships. We want them to get all that free money and leave those loans alone. Um, students do need to uh, find assistance a lot of times with the financial aid application. And what we've been hearing over the last year is that a lot of our students are receiving help from their uh, high school counselors and either their high school counselor isn't aware that they're coming from foster care or they're just unsure of how to fill it out correctly for a student coming from foster care. So best practice is always to send them to that local transition center so they can receive help with, uh, from that education specialist there. Uh, students can also go to their local college, even if they don't plan on going to that college, they may have to self-identify, but they can go to that financial aid department and request assistance with the financial aid application. Again, best practice is always to try to get in contact with that college's foster care liaison, um, just so we can make sure that that financial aid application is filled out correctly. And then again, accepting those loans can negatively affect how much ETV funding a student is eligible for. So we always wanna make sure that they turn, on, turn down those loans unless absolutely necessary. So next, after they apply for financial aid, um, they can apply for Texas ETV. Our application for this coming fall actually came out on May 1st. So if you have any high school seniors or students that are gonna be attending college next year, they need to get those applications done as soon as possible um, right now. That way they make sure they get that money before school starts. So in order to apply, they go to our website, texasetv.com. Um, we have an online and a downloadable application there. Of course, we prefer online because that's instant and we don't have to read their handwriting. <laughs> so um, we also have all of our important dates there, our eligibility guidelines. Uh, we have an important documents tab and a few of those documents everyone will have to download and fill out. And then there are some optional ones that some students might need based on their circumstances. And then we do have allowable expenses there. Um, and just to let you guys know, on our application itself, it is going to ask the student um, on one page for a case manager and their information. They can actually put any trusted adult they would like there. They can put their CASA worker, they can put it, their case worker, a case manager at the transition center, whoever their most trusted adult is. There's also gonna be another page that is a release of information page, and it has another three spots for trusted adults, for students to list there that we are able to talk to um, with their permission. And um, you guys actually get the same emails as the student. So for instance, if we have a hard time getting a hold of the student, you guys at least know what we're still asking them for. Like if they're missing documents, you guys will get those reminders. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're helping your student, have them put you down some in one of those two spots so that um, you can help them after they have turned in their application. Um, all of the students pictured in this um, PowerPoint are, are some of our alumni and they've given us permission to use their stories. In fact, we have some of their stories on our website. Um, and we do have a chat feature on our website that doesn't get used very often at all, <laughs> um, but it's in the bottom right hand corner. It's a little blue box. And if it's 830 to 530 Monday through Friday, you can get real time answers to your questions about the application or our website. Just keep in mind, once your student has turned in their application and they're wanting to know the status, we can't talk to them about their individual circumstances on chat because of HIPAA they would need to contact their coordinator directly to talk about the application. And just to kind of also throw out there, Drew and I are always available to help students um, with their application um, and help them, but we do not have the most up-to-date information on their application. And so um, if they're asking us about, we usually have to send them to their coordinator as well, just because it, whatever answer we give them could be inaccurate. So here are some of the deadlines for the applications. For the fall semester, it's October 1st. For the spring, it's March 1st. And for the summer, 
is July 1st. Uh, we definitely don't want students to wait till that deadline. Um, we, we want them to get funded as early as possible. Um, and we do want to let you know as professionals that there are always extensions through the ends of each one of these months. Um, we don't like to advertise that to the students because we want, to, want them to get all that stuff in early. Um, but when in doubt, always have the student apply and our coordinators will let them know whether they missed the deadline or not. So just some tips for applying for ETV. They only have to do one application per school year. So I know Drew just shared with you guys the fall, spring and summer application deadlines. The spring and summer deadlines only come into play if they didn't fill out one for the fall and meet and meet that deadline. So um, the very first time they apply, it'll just be an initial application. And then every time after that, it'll be an update. Um, they need to check every semester they plan to attend. For some reason, our students get onto our application and they mark fall and then move on. They don't mark spring and or summer if that is going to be the case. Um, the problem with that is when the coordinator is um, kind of configuring their amount of need, if they're only going to attend one semester, the most they're actually kind of penalized by the federal government and the most they can get right now out of that 12,000 is 4,000 if they're only going to go one semester. But if they're going to go fall and spring like a typical student or even like fall and summer, any combination of two semesters, they can get up to 6,000 per semester. So it is definitely better for them to attend two semesters rather than just one. Um, we do need their full legal name on all of their documents. A lot of our students will put their nickname, the name they wish they had, the name they're going to change their name to. And even if they're in the process of changing their name, we still need their legal name at the time of the application. Um, a lot of our students have never filled out paperwork before. You know, there's so much liability in foster care. Foster parents often will just do it themselves rather than have to deal with the ramifications of something being done wrong. And so sometimes the littlest things can throw these students off because they're just not used to doing this. Um, I've had a student confused about date of birth because she had only ever heard it as birthday. So she didn't know what to put. Um, I also had another student confused about the zip code because you could enter more than five digits and they didn't understand if it was a zip code, why it would be more than five digits. Um, so very important, we always recommend that of course they get um, a trusted adult to help them. Our application is pretty basic though. It's, it really doesn't, it's not like the FAFSA application where even like a college educated person is confused and don't know what to do. Um, when they, our application is in stages, so they get to the first page, it's like their name and contact information. And I can't, I think the next page is like school information and they kind of keep going on. They have that where they ask for the case manager and they ask for the, the uh, release of information. So when they get to the very end, they do need to click submit. A lot of them will just log off and they never actually click submit. So we never actually see it. And so then we have to remind them later when they we tell them we haven't received their application because they're asking and we tell them, please make sure to go back and make sure you click submit and because it's all saved. They just need to click submit at the end. And then they don't need a fancy scanner or anything to turn in their documents. All they have to do is take a picture with their phone. In fact, most if you have an iPhone, you actually have a scan document setting on your iPhone in the notes app. Um, but they can also just take regular pictures as long as we can see the whole front and the whole back and it's not fuzzy. They can also do screenshots for anything that's on their computer. So nothing fancy to turn those documents in and to get them emailed. Um, they need to save a copy of their documents. Um, a lot of times we've had students at the transition centers, they take a picture with their phone or even scan it at the transition center, turn around to the nearest public trash can and throw them away. And now, of course, they've made themselves susceptible to identity theft because of all the important information contained in there. And then when we contact them to say, hey, this was fuzzy, can you resend it? They don't have it anymore. I had one student tell me, you know, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it. I'm not filling it out again. So I guess I'm just not going to get ETV. It's not worth it. And I reminded him what I do every month to get a $20 travel check. Like it's worth it. This is five, well, actually it's 12,000 right now. It's not just 5,000 anymore, but the 5,000 itself is worth it. And then of course, when a student submits an application, we only have four coordinators for the state of Texas. Um, 
And in fact, just to kind of let you guys know, if you're familiar with the regions of DFPS, your coordinator handles regions one, two, nine, 10, and 11. She is all the rural areas of Texas. So she has quite a few students. And actually, I will say she actually has the fewest amount, if you can imagine all of those. <laughs> That's still a lot of students. So it does take her up to seven business days to process documents in our office. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then it can take another two to four weeks for the money to then be distributed. So it's very important that they get all of this done as soon as possible so they can make sure they have that money for their rent or utilities before the school year starts. Students will have to turn in that supplementary documentation. Um, it's, it's kind of on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. But here we have like a core list of what most students are going to need. Um, of course, that first check mark is the initial application that students can find at texasetv.com. The next two students will need to acquire those documents from DFPS, and that's the DFPS verification of eligibility, some, sometimes called the VOE, and their tuition and fee waiver. Um, they'll also need to provide a copy of their financial aid award letter. For those students that are taking dual credits in high school, of course, they won't be receiving financial aid, so that would, wouldn't apply to them. Uh, but for any of our college students or post-secondary uh, school students, they would also need to provide that. And also a uh, class schedule. And then the budget worksheet and the request of funds forms can both be found on our website. Um, and we'll kind of go through that here in a minute. Um, and we. Another change that we had recently this past year um, was that we moved to direct deposit. We used to issue out checks. Um, we no longer do that. So students will need to have their, uh, their own checking account in their name and they'll need to provide their banking account and routing numbers. So as Drew mentioned, uh, the budget worksheet can be found on our website under important documents. Um, this is something that all students will need to turn in and they do have to turn this in once per school year. The thing about the budget worksheet, too, too many people, uh, professionals and students, um, take this way too seriously. All this is, is a plan for how the student is going to send their, spend their ETV funds. No other funding, financial aid, job, anything like that has to be included, just ETV. It is not set in stone. It is not down to the penny. Um, if a student is still in foster care, they will not be able to budget for living expenses or transportation because that is the responsibility of their placement. Um, and they should budget for the semesters that they plan to attend. So this is what that budget worksheet looks like. And as also, um, this is on our website and there's also a sample there as well. So you can always look at that sample. So you can see here, there are the semesters up at the top, fall, spring, and summer. It gives you the months that are included. Um, then you have the categories there at the left. Um, rule of thumb, if it fits in a category, it's allowed. So for instance, you might read in our rules that students cannot buy cosmetics with ETV funds. But if they're in cosmetology school, that would be school supplies. So if it fits in the category for that student, it is allowed. Um, students that are still in foster care would only be able to budget under books and related supplies and computer and computer supplies. Any of those other categories, um, if they do own their own vehicle and the vehicle is in their name, they can budget for the vehicle, um, but they're, again, the need for the cost of attendance on their school would have to, um, I guess, also support that need for the transportation. Um, but otherwise, it would, um, that would all fall under living expenses and they would not be able to include that. Any questions on the budget worksheet? And again, we don't expect you guys to remember all of this. We just want to introduce it to you. So if you're helping your students, you've kind of seen it before and you've kind of heard this. And so when you see that budget worksheet and you're looking at it, you're not panicking and thinking, oh my gosh, how do we do this? It's not that serious. <laughs> and Brandy, you said very clearly, this is just a plan. They don't have to turn in receipts or anything else to match up to that budget, correct? Correct, correct. We don't even want their receipts, to be honest. <laughs> so 
So the next uh, form we're going to talk about is the request of funds form, which can also be found on our website at texasetv.com. And all this form is uh, for is just letting our coordinators know who we're funding, where we're sending the funding to, and what the funding is for. So if a student is requesting funding for housing, they will also need to include the first and last page of their lease or the renting together contract, which can be um, which can serve in lieu of a lease for those students that may not be on a lease. Uh, students that may be living with grandma or, or with a friend, um, they would provide that renting together contract. And then if a student is requesting funds for utilities, they would also need to provide a copy of their utility bill. And for those students that are over the age of 21 or students that are still in care, they would just be requesting funds for themselves and they would fill it out uh, as a release of funds to the student. So here's an example of a student that is a, is a high school graduate and it looks like they're out of care or um, over the age of 20 or under the age of 21. Um, this student is renting a room from cousin Charlie and that's cousin Charlie's address underneath. And then in the, the description of goods, this student is requesting funds for the months of August, September, and October at $500 a month. Uh, for your students that are still in care or over the age of 21, they will just fill this description of goods out for themselves, and they'll just say uh, release of funds to the student in the description of goods box. So just some other things you need to know, ETV is not emergency funds. So unfortunately, if a student waits until the last minute, like they wait till that October deadline, there is nothing we can do to speed the process up, even if they're needing it for rent or utilities. If they have an emergency situation with their housing or something like that, and they've waited till the last minute, they can always check with their transition center and their aftercare case manager. Um, but unfortunately, there is nothing we can do um, with ETV. They just have to wait out the process. Um, as we mentioned before, receipts are not required. In fact, we don't even really want them. So um, we're not, BCFS is not going to be verifying what they buy. So for instance, um, one of the rules is they cannot buy a car with ETV, but we would never know if they actually did. Um, we don't like, of course, to advertise that to the students, but we, we would never know. The maximum 12,000, of course, is not guaranteed. They do have to display a need based on their financial aid um, application and the cost of attendance for the school. Um, I do also want to point out, because this has been a question here lately, I've had several times um, with students. Even if a student um, is currently like blocked from financial aid, because maybe they had a bad semester, or they're not um, making satisfactory academic progress, they do still have to apply for financial aid. They just have to turn in the document saying they are not eligible for financial aid. Um, that actually makes them have a greater need with ETV. So it doesn't actually keep them from getting ETV unless they've hit that eighth semester and the fact that they're not making satisfactory academic progress affects them. Um, if a student only checks that they're attending that one semester, again, they're penalized and the most they can get is 4,000 as opposed to the 6,000 if they uh, attended two semesters. So here are some of the issues that are facing our foster youth as they're heading into post-secondary education. Uh, choosing that right program for them, the right educational program for them. Uh, a lot of our students just aren't aware of all the options that are out there. Um, we do have a lot of students that may not be interested in a traditional four-year school. Um, and just working with our students to, to let them know that they have options uh, in technical vocational schools and some of those programs at community colleges are really good. Um, also, how to find all that free money, how to get access to those grants and those scholarships and definitely learning the difference between uh, those grants and scholarships and loans, big difference. Um, students just aren't aware that they're gonna have to pay back those loans and they're not aware of how hard it is gonna be to pay back those loans. Um, also understanding the real costs. Uh, students will be receiving their Pell Grant. They'll be receiving that tuition waiver and possibly ETV funding. And they just think that money is gonna last forever. And we all know that that money goes real quick and they're gonna have to really budget uh, there's going to be a lot of top ramen nights, um, and we, we just have to work with our students to, to help them understand that. Also, 
how to access uh, community resources. Uh, there are a couple of resources I'd, I'd like to share. One is AuntBertha.com. You may be aware of that already. Um, it's basically a website where students can go or anyone can go and you enter your zip code and it gives you a list of all of the community resources in your area. Um, a, a really great resource for, for our students. And then there's also a new program that is new to Texas. I know it's been in California for a while. Um, it's the Together we, we Rise program. And it's a rapid response program. Basically, the, it, it, it provides emergency funding for students that, um, that may need assistance throughout the school year. Um, I know that students in that program do need to be referred. Uh, by an agency. So maybe that may be something you want to look into as far as becoming a partner. And I'll put that link in the chat as well. Um, also, how to, how to uh, plan for what they want to go into. A lot of our students know what they want to do. They just don't know the steps that they need to take to get there. Uh, so working with our students to help them figure that out and navigate the post-secondary process. Also, um, academic support. When students are in high school, they have uh, teachers looking over their back all the time. You know, they have so much support, but when they get to college and post-secondary school, they, they kind of have to seek out that support. So really working with students before they go to school to help them find those tutoring resources can help as well. And then developing, ma maintaining that budget. For most of our students, this will be the first time that they've ever completed a budget. Uh, just helping our students understand the importance of the budget and um, the importance of sticking to that budget is really important. And just like all of us, balancing life and taking care of emotional and physical health uh, while students are in foster care, uh, basically, you know, their, their doctor's appointments are scheduled for them. Um, they, they don't really have to think about their health. Um, so really working with our students uh, and, and letting them know they need to reach out when it's time to get help uh, as far as their, their physical or their mental health. The ways that we can help as professionals, of course, is making those connections within our community with other providers. Um, so getting to know those foster parents that have group homes and direct care staff at the facilities, uh, the Department of Family and Protective Services staff, both the Preparation for Adult Living Unit and the regular caseworkers, our aftercare service case managers. This is so important. That's actually what Drew did before he came over to ETV. He worked in our transition center um, and as he can tell you, it's like pulling teeth trying to get connected with those students. And unfortunately, these foster parents are not getting this done. This is something they should be doing before these students age out. They should make sure um, that they don't, that the students don't need to have an intake. Um, but they can go um, to, of course, you guys have BCFS there in Abilene. Y'all have a transition center that's through our organization. And um, they can call. I don't know if you guys are a CASA chapter that is allowed to. I know it's different based on the county, but some CASAs can uh, transport students for, with, when they visit. If you guys are able to, that's something you guys could even do on your visit is take your student to the transition center for their intake. You just call and make an appointment. Um, right now, they might even be doing it virtually. So that means no one even has to take them up there. So making sure that student gets connected with that transition center, they get case management services until they're 21. And some of the other resources there, they have available to them beyond that. So very important um, that they know that that exists and that that's a resource for them. Also the foster care liaisons, there's liaisons at the ISD level, but there's also um, foster care liaisons at the college level. That is actually required in the state of Texas. So it's very important um, that those students know who that foster care liaison is because the liaisons don't always have access to the students coming in. So they might not even know that the student is there. So the student might need to, and please encourage them to do that, to get in touch, maybe even facilitate that meeting um, to get that student to contact that foster care liaison at the college and let them know, hey, I'm one of your students coming from foster care. That liaison sometimes has resources that only those students um, qualify for. They might even have extra scholarships and they might, might have extra money. So very important um, that they get in contact with those foster care liaisons. And then just also, again, this information going out to those school counselors so they can reach all of those students that they um, 
uh, have access to and your other community partners and faith-based organizations? So some things we can do to help is just making sure that we're talking to our students early and often about their plans for the future and making sure that they know about both their post-secondary benefits and those aftercare benefits. R really important. Uh, we have, uh, as a case manager, I, I would have so many youth that come to me at the last minute or, or after they had uh, already passed the age of being eligible for some of these benefits and they just didn't know about them. So really talking with them early. And what we've seen is that if, when students know about these benefits, it gives them hope. So uh, really talking with them about these benefits uh, is a big help. And then also making sure that our students are taking the right classes that are gonna prepare them for post-secondary education. If they have a cosmetology program in their high school and they wanna go into cosmetology, we need to make sure that they're in those programs. Um, also, those students that are not interested in a traditional four-year college, uh, technical vocational schools are a really great option. Um, we, there are even technical vocational programs at those community colleges where they can use that tuition waiver as well. Um, and sometimes our students uh, that go to those schools can come out making more money than a student with a bachelor's degree. So really great option there as well. And then uh, making sure that we're talking to our foster parents about higher education. Some of our, our foster parents are just not aware of all the options that are out there. And then again, uh, this will be a requirement for graduating seniors, but we wanna make sure that they, uh, our students are applying for financial aid as close to October 1st, the opening day for the FAFSA as possible so they can make themselves eligible for all of that free money. So I know this seems silly, but I think you guys will understand this generation does not know how to use the telephone properly. <laughs> They're used to texting and social media. So um, remind them, because um, Drew and I, when we go out and we're meeting the students in person, I can't count the number of times they complain to me about, I've called my coordinator five times and she won't call me back. The first question I ask them is, when was the last time you left a message? And I get the deer in the headlights, like why on earth would I leave them a message? Doesn't everybody have caller ID? And yes, we do have caller ID, but we get hundreds of phone calls a day and we're just not able to call all those people back to include a lot of telemarketer calls, I might add. <laughs> and we're just not able to call all those people back if they don't leave us a message. So I always remind them if they leave a message, their coordinator has two business days to get back to them. And I will tell you, a lot of our students do not know what a business day is. Um, we, when I was explaining to students about the seven business day turnaround for documents, um, we did an application session on a Friday and I had a student calling me on Monday saying, what is the status? And I said, well, remember you, we said seven business days and he justified it as yeah, seven business days. That's a week. And that was last week. And it's like, yeah, but that was Friday and it's Monday. It's been one day. So, um, so again, just remind your students, give their coordinator two business days to return their phone call or their email. Um, I always recommend that they do both. That way the coordinator can get back to them the quickest way possible. Um, remind them, some of us are older. We need them to speak a little slower and give us a chance to write the phone number down and write everything down while they're talking. Maybe even repeat the phone number again. Um, so again, just remind your students about phone etiquette. So just like our students aren't really great with phone etiquette, they're also not great about keeping the same phone number for a long period of time. Uh, I've had my number, my same phone number since 1997, and that's just not the case with our students. Um, when I'm talking to our students, I always tell them that these are the most, these are probably the most two important things that they need to know um, from this presentation or uh, about ETV. They're first going to need that free email account. Um, and a lot of our students use their high school email or they use their, their college email and then they graduate high school and they or they transfer uh, colleges and they lose that email. This is going to be the main mode of correspondence between our coordinators and the students. So as long as they have that free reliable email that they can um, always access, we can help them through this process. But if they don't have that email, we can't get in contact with them and we can't help them through it. 
Um, so it's really important. And then again, uh, we just moved to direct deposit. So it will be a requirement now for students to have their own checking account in their name. So we can um, use that direct deposit to, to fund them. So I mentioned earlier, there are foster care liaisons at the ISD level and the college level. Here are the websites where you can look those up if you don't know who those folks are. Um, so the top, we have, of course, the ISD liaisons. And then there in the middle, we have the foster care liaisons. Again, if you know your student is going to be going to college um, and it's a Texas public, well, actually, even if it's private, um, all of the college liaisons are listed there. Um, and then some schools have foster care alumni groups, and those are really good support systems for our students because they can talk to, you know, the alum, the, the, you know, the juniors and seniors of the group, find out the best professors to take, the best classes, how, you know, what, what mistakes they made that, you know, the new incoming students can learn from. Um, and so, you know, make sure that they check with that foster care liaison and see if they do have one of those foster care alumni groups for the student to join and again, encourage them to participate in those activities. And the young lady I spoke about earlier uh, that saved up all that money, she got involved with the foster care alumni group and they were able to, to provide things for her, her apartment. They were able to provide her with an HEB card so she can get extra food throughout the semester. And she actually wound up becoming one of the, the leaders of the alumni group. So it's a really, uh, really great resource as well. For those students that may be thinking of leaving home and staying in on, on campus in the dorms, um, they may have an issue with housing during the breaks, the, the spring breaks, the summer breaks, uh, winter breaks. Um, but if they go to that institution ahead of time and let them know that they may have an issue with housing during the breaks, it's going to be partly the responsibility of that institution to help them find housing. And I know for some of our students uh, that have gone through this COVID period, um, when everyone else was sent home, we had students that went to their institution ahead of time and they were allowed to stay on campus while everyone else was sent home. So really, really big if for those students that are, are leaving home and staying in the dorms. So you guys have probably heard of supervised independent living, which is a type of placement that if a student decides to stay in foster care after the age of 18, that they can go into. I know back when I was a caseworker, these were few and far between. There was always a waiting list and they weren't necessarily anywhere near a college campus. Uh, the awesome thing going on right now is this is actually coming um, to college campuses. Um, it's, there were a few um, little small things here and there with some of the college campuses, but Texas A&M, uh, their entire system of 13 schools took it upon themselves to basically bring this to all of their campuses. So they, and they have been helping and assisting any other college that would like uh, to do the same program. And in fact, um, Dr. Kirk, who used to be the liaison at a Corpus, she's still there, but she's not the liaison um, at this time, but she basically made a playbook of what works, what doesn't work, and she's sharing it with all the other colleges, whether they're a and or not, but supervised independent living are at all of the a and campuses. And so what that means is a student can sign an extended foster care agreement after they turn 18 and stay. They go to live in the dorms. They are given a meal plan and a small stipend to help pay for other expenses. And they, they live on campus year round. They don't have to worry about those breaks like we Karen talked about. And so um, they live like a typical student. There's no way that any other student would know that they're still technically in foster care. But then they do have those caseworkers and people still looking in on them to make sure that everything is okay. Plus, they, they are more involved with that foster care liaison and any of those other um, uh, foster care alumni groups as well. They're, um, it, because the foster care liaison then knows that they're there and is able to extend those invitations to them. So I want to mention Texas State Technical College to you guys. While there are lots of technical vocational programs at the community college level um, that students can use both their tuition and fee waiver and ETV, this is one of only two exclusively technical vocational schools in Texas that are Texas public schools. The other is the Lamar Institute of Technology, but it's only in Beaumont. Um, so as you can see there, um, especially in your area, there are um, several locations throughout Texas for TSTC. 
Um, again, they can use both the tuition fee waiver and ETV for these technical vocational programs. And they have all kinds of contracts. They have contracts with aviation companies. They have programs like underwater welding. And like Drew mentioned, a lot of these programs, students will come out making more money than a lot of people with bachelor's degrees. So um, if your student is just not interested in college, this is a really good alternative for them to come out ahead, not start off, you know, flipping burgers or making minimum wage. They can actually get a career and something that they enjoy doing, something that they're interested in. Uh, the University of North Texas, which is just north of Dallas and Denton, they have a summer bridge program. They also have supervised independent living on their campus. But this, the summer bridge program, what it is, it's for any student that is coming from foster care that is new to UNT. They take up to 15 students per school per summer, they've never been full though. So there's no waiting list. They put them in a dorm, they have a meal plan. They have a small course load that they have to take together. They have mandatory study times um, and they are also introduced to the foster care alumni group. They have to take a college 101 class together and that's just a one hour class. But part of that is they have Drew and I come out and spend that time one day to do their ETV application. So very useful for them. Um, in the long run, it's supposed to be so that when they hit fall, they hit the ground running. They've already taken classes. They're familiar with the campus. They can stay in the supervised independent living program or go out on their own and live off campus or live in the dorm. But they kind of have that foundation set to be successful. And again, they even had mandatory study times to kind of put those good habits in place. So really good program. Brenda Sweeten is an amazing foster care liaison. She has lots of resources. Um, I've seen where a lot of her students get extra scholarships because of her. And of course, their foster care alumni program is called PUSH. Um, I mentioned earlier that all the a campuses have supervised independent living, but I like to point out uh, a and Corpus Christi. Um, it is a fairly easy school for students to get in, unlike the college station location, their eligibility um, requirements are going to be significantly higher. Um, but it really neat campus there down in Corpus Christi on the beach. As you can see there from the picture, it's the only college in the world that's on its own island. So a uh, neat campus there at Corpus. They have a lot of support for them there too. So um, you guys might not be aware, here in San Antonio, we are part of a pilot program called Bear County Fostering Educational Success. And what that means is that any of the students going to any of the public schools here in San Antonio, um, there is extra grant funding for anything and everything that will help them do well in school, like tutoring, or that helps them to stay in school, like helping them with housing if that's an issue. So the students that, I mean, the schools that are participating are Texas A&M San Antonio, which has supervised independent living. Also the University of Texas at San Antonio, which also has supervised independent living. And then our Alamo Community College system here in San Antonio, which again has lots of technical vocational programs as well. Some of their campuses have supervised independent living nearby. Of course, they don't have dorms. So it is an off campus thing. Sometimes it's like right there, right by it, like within walking distance. Some are still working on it, but um, they do still have access to this funding. And so just as an example, we had a student going to Texas A&M San Antonio she was turning 21 in the middle of a semester, which means she's aging out and going to have to leave extended foster care. They were able to use that grant funding to keep her in the dorm for the rest of the semester so that she would not um, have to change programs in the middle of a semester and have to worry about all of that with school going on. Um, they also made sure that she was going to be set up and ready to go for the next semester. We also, I'm sure you guys remember that big snowstorm we just had back in February. Um, we actually, one school had a student that was stranded with no vehicle, no way to get out. She had no food in her house and, no, and also no power. So they actually were able to use the money to find as many delivery restaurants and they paid to have food delivered to her during that time until her power, till everything was back up and running and she could get food uh, for herself. So it's things like that. Anything and everything that would prevent them from doing well in school or staying in school, that's what that grant funding is for as long as they can justify it. In researching for my own student, 
I discovered that these um, Ivy League schools, and this is for any student, this isn't just for students in foster care, but our students in foster care um, are eligible because, of course, when they fill out the FAFSA form, there is no parent salary. These schools, when a parent's salary is less than 70,000, and some it's upwards of 150,000, um, they have revamped their financial aid programs uh, to not charge those students tuition and fees. And schools like Stanford even include room and board when a student lives on campus. So I know when I was a caseworker, everybody, it was pushed about that tuition and fee waiver. They have to go to school in Texas. They have to go to school in Texas. And while I highly, highly recommend they take that one college course at a Texas public school in order to lock in that tuition and fee waiver for life so that they can always come back to Texas and get other degrees. If they have the test scores and the grades to get into these schools, um, they have that option for them as well, and they can take ETV with them. So again, if you've got a brilliant student, this is an amazing opportunity. Just have them take that one college course at a Texas public school before they leave. So here's a map of the DFPS regions. Uh, just so you know, there's, there's always at least one transition, transition center in each region. Uh, some even have two, I think uh, the most is three. Um, but students, no matter what region they're from, they can go to any transition center around the state. Transition centers are supposed to be a one-stop shop for our students. This is where they're gonna find all of their aftercare benefits. Uh, this is where they're gonna find their case manager. Just being a former case manager, I know how much we really help our youth with uh, just starting life, uh, getting their ID, making sure they have groceries, making sure that they, um, they have access to emergency funding if needed. Um, but this, this case manager is gonna connect them with all of their aftercare benefits. So really important to get them connected there. Also uh, transition centers provide housing assistance, transportation assistance. There's always a Texas workforce advocate on site as well as an education specialist so they can receive help with employment or uh, filling out that financial aid application, applying for schools, things like that. Um, our our uh, BCFS, we do have mental health counseling and that's through our resiliency through healing program, as well as most transition centers have at least uh, a couple of computers, if not an entire computer lab. So students can go in and get what they need to get done online for free. Um, and then I'm not sure if you're aware of the most recent numbers that I've heard, um, but this was before COVID uh, about a year ago, just, just um, that, 50% of our foster youth that are aging out of foster care in the state of Texas wind up homeless within the first two years of aging out. And it's really big that they have these transition centers. Unfortunately, our transition center has been closed for the last year to year and a half. Um, so I, I, I really do think that these numbers have gone up, unfortunately, but it's a great place for our, our students or our youth to get off the street for some of our homeless youth um, to get something to eat. Um, they also, we also provide free parenting classes and free substance abuse counseling. I do see a question in the chat. Um, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm not positive where Mineral Wells is. Um, so, but I could, I could probably look um, it up before we leave. Um, do you know about how far that is from Abilene? Like it's east of Abilene before Weatherford. So I don't know the exact mileage, but it's between Abilene and Weatherford. So it's, it's, if it's not region two, it's probably going to be region three. I'm thinking it um, might be. Yeah, Thank but I, I can look it up. Um, so of course you guys, um, the transition center closest to y'all would be the BCFS office in Abilene. Um, depending on where your student does go in Texas, there are different entities. Um, BCFS has Region two, four, eight, and 11. Yeah. yeah. And then depending on, for instance, like Buckner has region one, and region five, and of course, region three, that would be track in Dallas and Fort Worth. And so, um, but they can go to any of those transition centers, depending on which one's closest to them. Um, but again, in your region, that's going to be the BCFS office there in Abilene. And um, right now, all of our offices are closed due to COVID, but we are supposed to be opening up 
um, in the middle of June. And then my understanding is by, I wanna say June 21st-ish, <laughs> um, then students can, can then come into our offices as long as nothing changes. So um, again, this is y'all's transition center there in Abilene. Students can still call that number and can still get connected with a case manager. And again, this is one of those things that is just not happening with the foster homes. Um, so anything you guys can do to assist your students in getting connected with that transition center and their after case, aftercare case management um, is super important. And I just looked that up. Um that mineral, mineral wells will be in region three. Okay. So here's the information for the ETV program. Um, the students or professionals that wanna get in contact with us can go ahead and dial that 877 number. You'll just go ahead and enter the region that you're calling from and you'll be transferred to the coordinator for your region. Diana Pollen, um, again, is the one who does region two, but again, she does one, two, nine, 10, and 11. Um, so she has quite a few students. Um, so please make sure you give her the two business days to respond by either phone or email. Um, but she is pretty quick. Um, and so um, if you want a student applies and they wanna know the status of their application, they will need to talk to Diana because Drew and I just don't have access to the most up-to-date information. But if they need help applying for ETV or just have other general questions, um, Drew and I are a little easier to get a hold of, and so they can uh, contact us. And then this is the information for Brandy and myself. Uh, definitely feel free for students that are applying for ETV um, that have any general questions, they can always contact us and we'll help them through the process. Or if you wanna pass our contact information along, this is a free service and we would definitely speak to anyone that might benefit from hearing about these resources. Um, again, this is Kimberly Bruzewitz information, again, from To Engage. Um, she's gonna be the PAL coordinator for region two. So any of your students that don't know their PAL worker, um, they can find out from her. And then, um, Debbie Wellborn, I am so sad. She's y'all's education specialist, but she will be retiring by July. Yeah, I know, I know, I'm so sad about it. I love Debbie. Um, she has been an amazing resource um, for us. And then also just um, in terms of her consortiums and everything, um, it's gonna be hard for someone to fill her shoes. But if um, Debbie Wellborn typically has education consortiums like two to four times a year. And so um, sometimes it's really good to be involved in those because she talks about new legislation that, um, affects our students in foster care. Um, also, it's just a good way to network and get to know those community partners um, and just a lot of information on education. In fact, that's there are several things in this PowerPoint I could point out that are literally, in fact, that very first slide we shared with y'all about uh, what's required of high school counselors came from Debbie and her consortium. We got that information from her a few years back. So um, we always learn new things from her that we incorporate to try to pass around. Um, and so, but you can get on her mailing list um, so that you can attend her consortiums. Of course, right now they've been um, virtual. Um, I don't know what they're gonna be come this, I don't know if she'll have any more this year, um, but she could at least pass her distribution list on to the next education specialist. And so you might wanna contact her before July if you wanna get on that. Um, also keep in mind, whoever this person is, um, one of their main jobs is if you feel like your student, their educational needs are not being met, whether by the placement or by the school, she can get involved and they can go to the ARD meetings, um, anything like that. So very important that you contact that education specialist if you feel that way. And then I also want to um, give you guys the foster care ombudsman information. This person is a separate entity from the Department of Family and Protective Services. This is not where you report abuse or neglect. Of course, use that hotline number that you guys I'm sure all have on speed dial on your phone. But um, the foster care ombudsman is there to make sure the student's rights are being observed. So for instance, if a student is upset because they feel like they're not getting their sibling visits like they should, or maybe there's a piece of property that belongs to them that was taken away that shouldn't have been, 
um, they can contact their foster care ombudsman and make that complaint and that will be investigated to make sure that their rights are being observed by the placement, the, the caseworker, everyone involved. And then again, our website is texasetv.com. That's where students are going to find that ETV application. And if they ever have any questions while they're on our website, they can always use that chat feature to get real-time answers. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Remind. A lot of schools and school districts are using that to remind students and parents about projects, PTA meetings, um, events going on at the school, anything and everything like that. Um, we are using it to remind everybody, uh, professionals and students about ETV deadlines, changes due to COVID. Um, and even like when that FAFSA website come, or that application opens up on October 1st, we will be reminding everybody, hey, it's FAFSA time, get that application turned in. So if you guys would like those reminders, um, you can sign up for CASA ETV. That is specifically for CASA. So anything and everything that pertains to CASA that you guys might wanna know, we send out reminders there. For your students who will be receiving ETV, whether they're getting it now or they'll be getting it in the fall, they can sign up for ETV 21. Um, we, again, put all those reminders on there. Um, we also, um, because we wanna keep them engaged and we don't want them to unsubscribe, we actually do trivia contests and stuff and we mail them prizes if they're one of the first ones to answer correctly um, and we like to ask them questions we did some fun ones over Christmas but for the most part we ask them questions of things that we really want them to know so if they answer it incorrectly or if they tell us I don't know we will actually look up the answer so for instance we might ask them who is your aftercare case manager and where do they work so if they're one of the first ones to answer that, they get a prize. And if they say, I don't know, like, or I, I know where my transition center is, but I don't know who the case manager is. We um, try to help them connect with those resources. And so we kind of question them on those things to then find out which ones don't know so that we can connect them with the right people. We've also asked them who the foster care liaison is at their school, um, just anything and everything like that that we want to make sure that they know. Then we'd also like to invite you to like our Facebook page. Um, you'll also find the most uh, recent up-to-date information on ETV. We've had so many changes coming down from both the federal and the state level, and you'll find all of those recent changes there. I don't know if you can hear that thunder in the background. Um, also, uh, reminders on ETV, you'll find th some of those reminders. We also do the trivia for the students here. Um, you'll find information on Texas schools that are doing really innovative things, have really great programs for our students. And then we also do national celebration days like National Pizza Day or National Coffee Day. And Brandy will go on, the, on this page and update you every hour on where you can get free pizza or free coffee around the state of Texas. Um. We have some scholarship databases here for you guys. Y'all can just click on the link when you have the PowerPoint. Get Make sure those students look for all that free money. There's so many scholarships out there. There's scholarships for being left-handed. We wanna connect them to as much free money as possible. These two scholarships are done by the Department of Family Protective Services, but they're not very well known. Um, the first one is for freshmen and the second one is for upperclassmen. And then last slide here, guys, I promise. Um, these are some additional resources for you if you need to know who an education specialist is in another region. Um, we also have the link there for all the preparation for adult living supervisors in Texas, all the transition centers in Texas, all the supervised independent living providers. Texas Youth Connection is done by the Department of Family and Protective Services, and they have lots of resources on there for students going to college and even has information about a student's Medicaid that they get through age 26. Um, there's also College for All Texans, which is a really good resource for our students wanting to know um, some resources for college, um, some tips and tricks for financial aid, that type of thing. Then we also have the link to the DFPS website that shares all the transitional living services that our students um, can be uh, eligible for. So um, do you guys have any other questions? Any questions, guys? And you are welcome to unmute yourself if you'd like. 
Um, while they're thinking for a second, I just want to hit on something that Brandy and Drew talked about is that they've gone to direct deposit for the ETV benefits. You may have to help coordinate with the caseworker, the PCM, to get the bank account set up. I know last year when we were trying to set up for my child, we worked together to figure out how we were going to get that done. And, you know, I offered to take her in. Then the case manager said, well, I can take her in. And by doing that, I think they had like $25 or something that they could put towards opening an account. But have that conversation, initiate that conversation with that PCM and with the student and let's get them set up. Again, that's normalcy. Let's help them get things set up that will put them in a position to succeed. All right, questions. And Rebel, I did just send you a copy of the PowerPoint as well okay. through email for it. Great. Well, guys, if you don't have any questions at all, um, I guess then we will finish up our presentation today. And I think I'm really glad we went ahead and had this because that increase in benefits up to $12,000 for the next two school years. That's amazing. So guys, we really need to encourage our kids to activate those benefits. Let's try to get them plugged into that post-secondary uh, education and get them going, even if it is that vocational school, something that's gonna set them up to succeed. And this is a great time for them to do that with these benefits that are available. Um, Drew and Brandy, we appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for your expertise, for all of the information and just being will willing to help share information if we have questions, answer questions and that kind of thing. Thank you for having us. Yes, definitely. Thank you for having us. Well, give them a round of applause, you guys. High fives. Some have their cameras off, but we really do appreciate you guys so very much. I have the presentation. You can download it in the chat box. And then I also put a link in there about that supervised independent living. And um, some of you may be, I'll be honest, my, I have a hard time. My girl is just like, I want everyone out of my life. I don't want, but if they can understand the benefit to supervised independent living, then maybe they will be more likely to sign up for it. So check on that. Any questions you have, you've got their contact information and I'm going to conclude our meeting then if there's not anything else. Okay, Brandy, thank you. I think Drew, oh, Drew's still on there. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.